It was a simpler time back in the mid 2000s. If things were tough, you could just reach over for the perfect tool to help you de-stress, playing Nintendogs on the Nintendo DS. This compact bad boy boasted two screens, that's twice as many as a television in case you didn't know, and it could even fold for supreme portability. The console wasn't exactly pushing graphics to the next level, but that wasn't what was needed when you had games designed around the system's unique features. Or games that were just designed to be great. Mario Party and Kart DS, Nintendogs, and the DS Zelda titles certainly use the system's unique qualities, but then Chrono Trigger, or Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver, not so much. And that doesn't mean they aren't bloody brilliant. For our first piece of trivia, we're going to be taking a look at a game that made a little bit less of a splash than the rest of these, despite still being pretty decent. Glory of Heracles. This title is part of a series, but this release is the only one to be published outside of Japan. Originally owned by Data East and sold off after the company filed for bankruptcy, the franchise was bought by both Nintendo and Paon, co-owning the copyright between them. This meant that the game was able to introduce some fun references to other Nintendo titles. Just like when the game's hero is trying to come up with an alias for himself, where one of the names suggested for him is Pit, in reference to Kid Icarus though this quote doesn't even sound Greek, so it is dismissed. Another reference pops up in the forest where an earth nymph will say, hee hee, this path, it's secret to everybody, referencing the popular phrase from the Zelda series. And when the town of Heaven's Haven is destroyed, talking to an item shopkeep, she will respond, buy something and support my rebuilding plans, will ya? Another Zelda nod, referencing the phrase, buy something, will ya? Spoken by the merchant in Zelda 1. Another nod can be found when the party attempts to sneak aboard the Trantian giant horse headed for Troy, and Princess Piazza will lie to get the party passage on board. I am Princess Piazza, representative of Trantia's ally nation of, um, Arcania. The name of this nation, Arcania, is actually the homeland of Marth from Fire Emblem. Nintendo loves referencing their other games, but it isn't too often that they reference their literal selves, the people behind the company and the games. In Nintendogs, however, when walking your dog, it's possible to bump into a random dog walker named Shiggy and his dog, Pick. As you might have guessed, this is actually Shigeru Miyamoto, along with his real-life dog, Piku, which makes this reference rather sweet and a bit meta in some ways, as Pick was actually the inspiration for the whole game's creation. Before Spirit Tracks, there was of course another Zelda on DS, Phantom Hourglass. References to earlier Zelda titles can be found throughout the game, including the character of King Muto, who shares his name with Muto, the carpenter boss from Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and the Minish Cap. Not only that, but the other carpenters from these games and the Cobble Knights from Phantom Hourglass are very similar. Bremor, Brent, Doyle, and Mac in Minish Cap, Bremure, Brant, Doylan, and Max in Hourglass. There's more interesting secrets behind the characters' names in Phantom Hourglass, though sometimes these might not be so obvious. Bellum is the main antagonist of the game, a squid-like creature, while Linebeck, captain of the SS Linebeck steamboat, serves as a companion to Link to guide him through the world. At one stage in the game, Linebeck becomes possessed and must be defeated. It is this possessed form that has an unseen name, referred to as Bellumbeck in the game's official guide. Though the name can also be found within the game's code, suggesting it is in fact his name in this state, but the developers simply forgot to insert the boss's name when the battle begins. Bellum is actually an interesting character alone, particularly his relationship with the Ocean King. The contention between them may be a reference to the natural conflict between sperm whales and squid, with Bellum taking the appearance of a squid, while the Ocean King's true form being that of a whale. Some of the DS's ports introduced intriguing new elements, be them intentional or not, like with Chrono Trigger, which made one particularly challenging element of the game slightly easier thanks to what is likely a bug. Towards the end of the game, the player can choose to battle the Dream Devourer found at the darkness at the end of time, a boss which boasts a staggering 32,000 hit points. However, this invokes a slight oddity, as the game's HP value is stored in the code as a 16 signed integer, meaning that it cannot be any higher than 16 bits, with one of those bits indicating the sign of the number it represents. This is a little complicated if you don't know about how computers calculate number values, but suffice it to say, it's possible to wreck this boss by helping him out, and the game won't know what to do. 
After fighting this boss and getting past the first phase of the battle, the second phase initiates with the Dream Devourer absorbing magic, resulting in magic damage healing the boss rather than harming it. This is where the Tech Brain comes into play. By making the boss soak up an absolute ton of healing, giving it more health than it initially started with, it's possible to push the boss's health above 32,767, the maximum HP limit in the game. This results in the game's health count being above its limit, and so it will overflow and loop back to the beginning again. This means that the boss will ultimately heal up past its upper limit and breach the lower limit, healing to a negative number. As the boss is then read as having less than zero health, the battle will end, and the boss will be determined as dead. Though we suppose it's more like more alive than it can handle. Staying on the subject of great DS games that don't make too much use of the DS's unique features, there's a fairly refined secret within Mario Kart DS that was never used, though it can be reinserted. The code in question can be found in the game and re-enabled through the use of a cheat code, which utilizes display capture and blurs the player's screen whenever they use a boost to give the illusion of speed. The final game does actually try to enable this effect, but because the blur doesn't initialize, it winds up not being displayed. The code makes use of a coprocessor utilized in the game's multiplayer modes, so while it can be enabled, it is unlikely that the code would have worked in anything other than single player modes. Why the code went unused is unknown, but inconsistency across single player and multiplayer modes would have been a contributing factor, along with the fact that it could have been considered too distracting. More references can be found in another Mario game on DS, Mario Party DS. This time around, the reference can be found in the minigame Goomba Wrangler, and is a nod to another game created by Nintendo, Pokemon Ranger, a spin-off of the Pokemon series. The game involved the player drawing circles around Pokemon to capture them, similar to Goomba Wrangler. The French name for this minigame actually serves as a fairly on-the-nose reference to Pokemon Ranger, with it being called Goomba Ranger. Another interesting part of the European release of the game came with the website which listed the game's various boards. Wiggler's Garden was given a different name, being listed as P.T. Piranha's Greenhouse. While this original name may appear to make sense with it featuring a piranha plant at the top of the board, it falls short when you realise that P.T. Piranha doesn't actually appear in the game at all. Never mind the fact that the board is clearly based on a garden and really doesn't look like a greenhouse. And now, we make our way to the inevitable, talking about Pokemon for a Nintendo handheld. Heart Gold and Soul Silver are some much beloved entries in the franchise, and with them came a number of new Pokemon designs, some of which were never actually seen. One of the designs that does appear is a spiky-eared Pichu, which requires the player to have obtained a Pikachu-colored Pichu from an event in a copy of Pokemon Diamond or Pearl, and then trade it to Heart Gold or Soul Silver as to unlock a unique event. But this spiky-eared Pichu was originally supposed to be a white variation of Pichu, but this was changed during development thanks to Shoko Nakagawa, the Japanese voice actress for Spiky Pichu. In her autobiography titled Shoko Nakagawa, Pokemon Taught Me the Meaning of Life, Nakagawa claims, So originally, Spiky-eared Pichu was going to be White Pichu instead, and I heard they were even thinking about making a brand of white cream stew to go along with it and everything. But they eventually went with spiky-eared Pichu instead. The white stew in question was likely a product to sell as a pun on white Pichu's Japanese name, as it sounds very similar to white stew, Hawaito Pichu, and Hawaito Sichu. The change from a white Pichu to a spiky Pichu, however, is the result of Nakagawa often making a spelling mistake in her blog where she will accidentally use the word spiky like she is saying spiky happy instead of mega happy, inspiring Game Freak to use this concept for Pichu and have Nakagawa be the voice of the new creation. Did you also know that Retro Studios made a Zelda game for the Nintendo Wii? Or that Ocarina of Time's official manga explains a lot of missing details from the game? For a whole bunch of Zelda facts, check out the video on screen. Click it now. Good, click that bit just like you should. My links, my stats, click my links for my stats. My links, my. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, everyone. <laughs>